Good evening, everybody. Happy spring. Welcome to tonight's Comet Talk. My name is Megan Remington, and I'm CCC's Community Education Coordinator. And that is my, I don't know if you can hear that, that's my dog outside of my office. Um, so our Comet Talks are brought to you by Coconino Community College's Community Education Programs. We offer personal enrichment courses, workforce development training, and community education opportunities. And we're always interested in engaging and collaborating with our Coconino County community. So reach out to us if you ever wanna come up with something new, um, we're all for it. Um, so first, before we get started, I wanna tell you what's happening, what's coming up with community education. So we do have another comment talk this month. On April 22nd, Craig Merriweather um, is going to reprise his hypnotherapy session that he did, I think in February and it got rave reviews. So he is doing self-hypnosis for anxiety. Uh, after this comment talk is over, um, when I email everybody, I'll make sure I include a link to register for that if you are interested. And we're also going to be doing a graphic design for non-designers course starting on May 3rd. I'll include information about that as well. And finally, if you're familiar with Arizona Gives Day, um, I hope that you'll consider whether you, uh, I'm not sure if Flag Shakes has a, uh, has a page for Arizona Gives Day, um, but whether you give to Flag Shakes or if you're interested in giving to Coconino Community College, we certainly appreciate it. Um, and one way or the other, think about how you can support your local community. Um, so first of all, uh, how are you gonna interact with us during this presentation? So there are two different ways. Uh, we have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can enter questions over there. You can also type them into the chat box. I'll be monitoring both while Dawn is speaking. Uh, after, the, uh, after the webinar is over, you're gonna get sent over to a survey. I would really appreciate it if you would complete that survey so we know what you wanna learn next and we can start planning for the future, for the summer, for the fall, when we hopefully can start seeing you all in person again. And, um, and like I mentioned before, I'll be sending you an email with, um, with the information about what's coming up and also information about um, both flag shakes and the recording for this session. So to introduce our fabulous speaker, um, Don Tucker has a master's degree in Shakespeare and performance from the American Shakespeare Center in partnership with Mary Baldwin University and a BFA in theater performance from the University of Wisconsin. She grew up in Flagstaff and her lifelong dream has been to bring her passion of Shakespeare to her beautiful hometown which was realized in 2015 with the founding of the Flagstaff Shakespeare Company. Flagstaff Shakespeare Festival, there we go. The mission of the Flagstaff Shakespeare Festival, affectionately known as Flag Shakes, in case you thought it was like a milkshake from an awesome restaurant, which I suppose it still could be, um, is to faithfully portray classics of the Renaissance as well as produce other actor-driven plays. Each Renaissance performance incorporates Elizabethan sta staging practices, making these plays accessible and providing a unique learning opportunity. Their performances and educational outreach enlighten our audiences and revitalize empathy. And they're dedicated to offering exciting artistic opportunity and experience for residents of Northern Arizona and visitors from around the world. Uh, Dawn, thank you so much for being with us tonight and I will go ahead and hand it off to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be here um, in prepping for this. I realized how incredibly endless this topic is. So I'm really excited to talk about it, but I also hope that people came with a lot of questions. Um, a lot of people know just a little bit about what gender representation looks like on the Elizabethan stage, but uh, not a ton. Um, oh, so I see a question about you are muted, Justine. I haven't heard anything, so you must be on mute. I just yep, and there's actually, that. if you're an attendee, since this is a webinar, um, we actually, by default, everyone is muted, so no worries. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but please do use the chat like you just did to um, pop in questions, because I'd love to hear them. So um, I'm just going to share screen really quick. I have a very basic uh, slideshow um, to kind of help us work through this and just also so you can see kind of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm actually starting with just a slide of an Elizabethan theater. Some people don't know exactly what they looked like. Um, this is pretty close to what the globe looks like and they were all built fairly similarly. 
Um, this is a representation of something happening on stage. And I think it's kind of cool that we're talking about gender and women on stage, because you can see there are two female characters on stage. They certainly would have been male actors playing these female characters. But other really important things that I want to point out that are going to be vital to what we're talking about tonight are some of where the audience is positioned. So you'll notice that just above the two doors at the back of the stage, there's a bunch of people. Um, and those were actually audience members. A little bit higher up in the two smaller windows, there would have been musicians or a musician's gallery. But there are often audience members both on stage behind the stage, on stage on the sides of the stage, and then not pictured in this drawing representation all the way around the stage in that sort of like floor pit area. This made for a really rowdy, very interactive theater. And that's gonna become important when we talk about why women weren't on stage, what happened when they started to show up on stage and some of the issues with boy players. Um, there really wasn't any sort of decorum in a theater or idea about how you were supposed to behave. Um, one other thing that I want to say that is a misconception about Elizabethan theater sometimes is that there were absolutely women in the audience. Um, we know there were women in the audience because some of Shakespeare's characters refer to the ladies in the audience. Um, and also there are, there's at least one account of a woman um, uh, going into labor in a, in a theater. <laughs> so we know for sure that women were there. Um, it would have been women of almost all social classes except the very highest social class would not have showed up to the theater because people would have come to them essentially to perform theater. So what I'm gonna cover tonight is I'm gonna talk about, first of all, um, the boys who played Shakespeare's women. So we're gonna talk about the Renaissance what was going on on stage. I am gonna to touch briefly on Europe and other countries where there were women on stage and kind of talk a little bit about why, but also focus a lot on what the life of a boy actor was and also how having these specific boy actors in his troupe really like influenced Shakespeare's writing. Um, then we're gonna talk about the restoration, which is when the theaters, the theaters closed right after Shakespeare died for about 40 years. Um, when they reopened, that's when we first saw actresses on stage. So we'll talk about how women started to be on stage, why that started to happen. And then we'll kind of hop forward to the late 1800s with um, Sarah Bernhardt, one of my favorites to talk about in the birth of what we call pants rolls, um, which is the exact opposite of the boys playing women. It was now women playing men's roles. So we're gonna look at that reversal. I'm sorry, loud chair. And then we're gonna talk just a tiny bit about um, modern gender expression on the Shakespearean stage. So the ways that we play with it, the way that other theater companies play with it, um, sort of how it's changed since Shakespeare's time. I'll pause already to see if there are any questions. I can't. Yeah, nothing so far. Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Okay, um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is I wanna talk about uh, boys on the Elizabethan stage. There's this great quote up at the top, which is from Antony and Cleopatra. And it's just when they're talking about uh, Cleopatra, they're asking her to surrender. Um, and then she'll actually be a prisoner of uh, Rome, which is kind of interesting because she, she actually then starts talking about the Elizabethan theater. Um, when she makes this comparison. And one of her reasons for not wanting to become a captive is that she's terrified that she'll be taken and she, and, and her quote is, I shall see some squeaking Cleopatra, boy, my greatness. Meaning she's afraid she'll be sort of like paraded and presented and then also have to see herself made a spectacle of in the theater through probably like farce and satire. Um, so this is a great line. Shakespeare has a lot of these sort of meta lines where he allows his characters to acknowledge what is actually happening on stage. Because as we know, the character playing Cleo, the person playing Cleopatra would have been a boy. So she's saying this is her worst fear. It's actually what's happening on stage. Um, so it has that kind of meta moment. I chose just two photos here. One is of um, Edward Kinsington, who's really interesting to study. Um, but uh, he was one of the last boy players. 
Um, and this picture was from the restoration, but then it was like a sketch of a picture. And I don't think that we have the original engraving anymore. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of how young these boys were. Um, and the hand gestures that he's doing in this photo are actually kind of important. There was this whole catalog of hand gestures that boys learned to represent female emotions. <laughs> so of stuff um, that went on. Oops, sorry. Okay, uh, next to it, I wanted to put up this photo just because we're gonna talk a little bit, a tiny bit about the lead-based face paints that boys wore. Um, this is obviously an older actor in a modern play playing a, a man playing a woman. Um, and he's got his makeup on a la Elizabeth I, who was known for a very heavy application of this white makeup. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about that because it was it's kind of a sad, tragic side note of um, what it was to be a boy player in England. Um, so first of all, um, the training that pre-restoration, so not Edward Kensington, not the list of you know beautiful hand gestures that portrayed emotion, pre that during Shakespeare's time, the way young boys were being trained was really apprentice style. So they would be moved into the home of an older and more experienced actor in Shakespeare's troupe. That actor would show them the ropes as far as, you know, like um, how to memorize quickly, how to deal with your costumes, how to emote, how to carry off the language, etc. So they were really working as apprentices. Um, and they would, as, as, as they grew older, shift then to become male actors playing male parts and new young boys would be trained and those boys would be put into this apprentice system. They would learn how to act and they would take on these female roles. Um, so their lifestyle was really one where they were, you know, not necessarily paid. Um, they were given room and board. They definitely would start seeing some amount of payment or shares of payments that were coming in once they got to be a kind of older actor, but not while they were apprenticing. Um, the biggest criticism that they faced was from the Protestant, um, sort of like the louder Protestant community in England. As you can imagine, watching young boys flirt with older men on stage, maybe even kiss, maybe even embrace, was something that the sort of Protestant, um, I guess, I mean, there were people who were Protestant who didn't care, but the, the more zealous Protestants really took issue with. And so it became kind of an issue of their reputation as being, you know, mm, desirable or, above board or, or reputable. Um, so that was something that the young boys faced who were playing women. Hey Don, now, what, yes. Um, so we do have a question. Um, so the question is, uh, were the hand, so you referenced hand gestures earlier um, and the questions, were the hand gestures at all related to the religious hand sim symbols from Italian religious art, such as Madonna and often Christ as a baby pictured making hand gestures? <laughs> Um, related? No, they weren't related as in there wasn't a one-to-one -one correlation, but related in that this was the Renaissance and, uh, or this is, this is restoration, but related in that, you know, that was the last time we had seen a big Renaissance in art. And that was really the most influential art that we were seeing. Yes. I mean, I think it was just a fascination with hands as a means for expressing, you know, feeling, connection, et cetera. But related directly, no, I don't think that you could point out like this hand gesture in this painting was related to this hand gesture that young men use to express female emotions, <laughs> female emotions, because they're very different than male emotions. Um, yeah, so I hope. Um, so one thing I want to clarify very quickly is that I am specifically talking about most of this time, I'm specifically going to be talking about boy actors who are performing in otherwise adult troops. In Elizabethan England, there were entire troops of boy actors. Um, these were young boys who were valued usually for their voices, 
Um, they didn't just do singing though. And they also didn't just do like nice children's theater. Um, one of the most famous it sort of boy troop plays was called um, Night as in like, you know, the sort of chivalrous night, Night of the Burning Pestle, which was definitely an entendre. Um, so these boys troops were subjected to some of the same criticism and exploitation that young boys on the Elizabethan stage would have been in adult troops. But I just wanted to make it clear that I'm specifically talking about boys who played in adult troops because Shakespeare's troop was an adult troop. Um, so another interesting thing we can take a look at is we can take a look at if we think about that apprentice sort of style of training these young boys to be actors, then we can really look at Shakespeare's entire canon and learn a lot about the boys he must have had in his troupe at that time and how long they had been um, working with him and how accomplished they were of actors. So if we think about early, especially, um, something like um, Comedy of Errors uh, or um, some of those early comedies, even if we think about Titus Andronicus, which is an early tragedy, but really only has a couple of female roles, we might see that we don't have, and they're usually pretty clearly um, the fit into one of those categories of like, you know, um, virgin, mother, uh, witch. <laughs> so we have those categories and we have more stereotypical parts that they're getting. And then as Shakespeare's catalog matures, we start to see these plays like As You Like It, um, where we have also the funny trope of a boy playing a girl playing a girl, but female characters that have an extensive amount of lines, a very complex character with a complex arch and an interesting backstory. And so what we know then is that Shakespeare had some boys in his troupe who he felt really confident in. Um, we also know a couple other things about the boys in his troupe. We know he had one who was short and fair and one who was tall and dark haired. And we know this because we hear it in the language of what is said about each of these two primary boy actors who come up in some of those later, more mature works that he does. Um, and then I think I saw a question. Was there a question, yeah. Megan? I was just, yep. Um, and actually real quick, before I get to the question, um, just a quick question of you. Um, is your microphone by any chance um, kind of near where your arms are moving at all? Yeah, I keep hitting my button. Let me switch ears, sorry. Oh yeah, no, that's much better. We, it, it, yeah, we could hear it a little bit, but okay. Anyways, okay. <laughs> um, so the question is, um, were the boys schooled at the same time as their apprenticeship? I, I have to ask a clar clarifying question. What do they mean by schooled? Oh, uh, we will find out in a second. Okay. <laughs> I'm assuming generally educated maybe? Yeah, if they mean like sort of what we would think of as schooling, then no. Yeah, um, yep, they just, there's the clarifying. Yep, schooled is an education. No, they were not schooled at the same time. Um, typically in Elizabethan England, most, most young boys, and it was just young boys, would go to school to what we would consider about the eighth grade. And that was considered the completion of their education, at which point they would take on an apprenticeship. Um, some of these boys may have been in positions where they weren't schooled, um, you know, necessarily to that point. But what we do know is that they absolutely had to be literate. Um, they had to be literate because their roles came in, you know, written um, and not verbally. So we know that we had somewhat educated young boys, but uh, even Shakespeare only received an eighth grade education. That was really typical. The difference was that the education focused almost exclusively on linguistics. Um, they weren't really studying things that we think of, you know, kids, you know, studying like um, a little bit of math, but not like we think about, you know, um, chemistry or geography or anything like that. It was mostly linguistics that they studied until the eighth grade. Now, some upper class gentlemen went to college. This is where a lot of Shakespeare conspiracy theories start. 
um, and really should end because it's kind of elitist to say that just because he didn't go to college, he couldn't have written his works. He was certainly really well read. And I think fascinating side note tangent, Shakespeare's mother we know was literate and not a lot of women in Elizabethan England were. And that just opens up like endless possibility um, for the idea that she could have been reading to him, teaching him to read and write when he was a child in a way that a lot of other young boys wouldn't have gotten at home. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. And also the other reason it kind of crushes all conspiracy theories is because Shakespeare's contemporaries who were playwrights with college educations absolutely hated the fact that he was so popular without having gone to university. They just felt um, outraged that they should be way more popular than him because they had all gone to university. So when you have contemporaries talking about someone, oh, we sort of know they existed. <laughs> um, did I see another question come in? Or was that a clarification? Yes, oh no, yep, you are, okay. wow, you are right on top of it. Um, the question, <laughs> uh, did they live at home or in a, in a boarding school situation during the apprenticeship? Um, they lived at home during their educations. They lived in the house of an adult actor during their apprenticeship. So they would have been housed by the adult actor they were studying under, which was one of the reasons that it was, you know, lucrative and beneficial to try to get your son an apprenticeship because then you could essentially send him to someone else's house to be someone else's mouth to feed. Um, and that's another reason it didn't pay is because it was essentially seen as lucrative enough um, for them just to sort of be enticed by the idea of room and board. So, okay, cool. I love the questions, keep them coming. Um, I have, yeah, it's, there's so many endless facets to this topic. So I, you know, whatever you wanna know. Um, so then the last thing I was gonna say about sort of like tracking the boys who played um, the female roles in Shakespeare is that we can also see in that sort of very later part of his catalog, that he must have either had a young boy who was really capable of these of mature female roles and or he must have had an older male actor who was interested in continuing to play female roles um, because we start to see more mature roles for actors in his plays, in plays like Richard III, um, in plays like uh, Macbeth, in plays like um, Coriolanus, we see these sort of um, matronly figures start to pop up who are also deep and rich in character. So he must have had a new kind of actor that he was um, able to cast and use for these roles. Um, there's a whole other like subtopic, which is about who his clowns were and how that informed what the clowns were like in Shakespeare plays, but we just literally don't have time <laughs> today. Um, and I think I did see another question. Uh, right. Less a question and more of a, a statement. It was oh. um, the, well, and I'm not sure which part of your statement this was referring to. Oh. That um, in this day and age, that would really bring up some questions. So I'm assuming it had something to do with, well. Oh, so them living with the older male actor, I bet is what uh, it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> I, but yes, that would bring up some questions. In this yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then finally, one of the big misconceptions about boys in the Elizabethan era is that there is this just general idea that it was illegal for women to play boys. It wasn't. There was no legal precedent against it. Um, so why were boys playing the female roles instead of women? That is a very multifaceted question. Um, and it starts from it starts from a couple of places. First, if any of you have seen Midsummer Night's Dream, you might be familiar with the rude mechanicals. Um, and that's sort of one of the ways theater got started was groups of men who worked together putting up plays. Um, originally, they would have been like religious plays and then they moved on to some more, you know, uh, scripty kind of plays, exciting plays. But so it just kind of started as men because they did it within their occupation and only men were involved in those occupations. Also, it was seen as, you know, sort of an unsavory uh, occupation to have. So a woman being in theater would certainly lessen her chances at a good marriage, um, certainly lessen her in the eyes of society. There are also a couple of indications that, of writings of journals where you just see 
um, that people just thought men were better at playing women. Um, I have an example of the opposite next because the final part of that is that women were on stage throughout Europe at this time. This was really exclusive to England um, and it wasn't true you know, uh, everywhere else. So the next thing I have is a quote from, um, from the time period that I think is really great. Uh, and this is from um, uh, a journal of someone describing seeing women perform on stage in Venice. And he says, um, for I saw a woman act and they performed it with as good a grace and gesture and whatsoever convenient for a player as ever I saw a masculine actor. Um, so he was convinced that women could do it. A lot of Elizabethans weren't, uh, but I love this little quote because to me, it almost sounds like he's surprised. He's like, whoa, they actually did a good job playing ladies. Um, and this was considered a very like out there opinion on this kind of uh, staging practice. So that's really what I have on boys in the Elizabethan era. So if there's any other questions on that, I'd love to field them before I skip on to the restoration and women like taking their place on stage. So far, so good. Okay, cool. And if you come up with one later and you're like, I forgot to ask, I would love to answer it later. <laughs> so, um, okay. So then uh, women on stage. We're, we're gonna, this is a photo of Nell Gwynn. We're definitely gonna talk about Nell Gwynn. You can't talk about the restoration and female actors without talking about Nell Gwynn. And then on the right is um, Sarah Bernhardt as Hamlet. So we'll talk about both these ladies a little bit. Um, first, the restoration in 1660. So the theaters closed very shortly, were closed by sort of the, the church um, for religious reasons. Um, they were completely shut down and the theaters were dark for almost 40 years. Um, so in 1660, when theater comes back, because it hadn't been a lucrative business for so long, we really don't have new plays. So a lot of Shakespeare's works are coming back on stage. Um, a lot of Renaissance works in general are coming back on stage. Um, but also women start to show up on stage. And the same way that there's no real one definitive reason that they weren't on stage to begin with, there's no real definitive reason that they appear on stage in the 1660s. There's lore. It's not true because Nell Gwynn was an actress before she met James II and became his mistress. But there's this lore that it was her idea because she wanted to be an actress. And so she asked James to make it illegal for um, boys to play women. Um, that's not really how it started. Um, she was already acting before she met the king. It certainly helped popularize it as a profession for women, um, but at the same time also increased its sexualization because while Nell Gwynn was originally an actress, she was also the king's mistress. So that wasn't necessarily seen as something like a upstanding woman would do. Um, but she was also known to be very witty, uh, very beautiful, and very um, charming, extremely charming. Um, so once women start to take the stage in 1660, A, it increases attendance. <laughs> so people are like, oh, this is kind of cool. What's it going to look like to see a woman on stage? The unfortunate then sort of like snowball effect of it increasing attendance is that theater companies start to make those female roles more exploitative because they've seen that it can increase attendance, but they think if they make the roles more lewd, the costumes a little um, more sparse, the, the you know, uh, dialogue a little more suggestive, that that will increase attendance yet again, which it does. <laughs> um, and I think it's kind of, you know, an unfortunate, an unfortunate thing because in this way, the reputation of women on stage really doesn't start to pick up um, and doesn't start to um, um, be a reputable thing that you can do until, well, I mean, really almost until like the 1930s, <laughs> but definitely not until the eight, late 1800s with Sarah Bernhardt. Um, so yeah, like I said, Nell Gwynn was an actress. She was a very famous mistress of James II. She um, actually had two sons by him 
And she was his mistress for a very long time. She was really popular, both with the people and the court, which is hard for a mistress to manage. Um, and she was a huge fan of theater. So she definitely did uh, promote arts, promote theater going. Um, and we do have her to thank a lot for what women were able to do in theater. It's just not true that she's the reason women were back on stage. Um, so Sarah Bernhardt actually was a French actress. She wasn't an English actress, um, but she did play Hamlet um, in several countries. And a lot of people saw it. There are even little film snippets of her playing Hamlet, which is amazing. It's mostly just a sword fight. Um, unfortunately, in the version of the role that she played, the role was changed from uh, the original text in iambic pentameter, which is sort of a pretty poetic verse to prose. Um, and that led to a lot of skepticism about her ability to handle it. I think it was more about the fact that it was in a foreign language. And so things needed to be simplified. Um, and unfortunately too, a lot of the criticism that you find of her is not about her ability to play the role, but about her ability to play the role as a woman or about her as a woman. Um, so I think that's kind of a bummer, but she was good enough and she did carry herself with enough sort of dignity and um, professionalism that it started to increase the respect of women. But it really was a complete switch. If you think about, you know, just, just what we had seen before this switch was just letting women play women's roles. The idea that women were playing men's roles was a huge change. And it became really popular to have women play Hamlet. We are actually going to have a woman play Hamlet this summer. <laughs> um, and that is very traditional. Um, and also Henry V and also Julius Caesar um, that started to have women in some of those roles in Julius Caesar. So why those specific roles? Why did they think they suited women? I think there are probably dissertations out there on that idea. Um, and I can't specifically say. Um, yeah, so that's really the beginning of the actress. Does anyone have any questions on this moment in theatrical history? Nothing at the moment. Okay, cool. I'd strongly recommend taking a look at um, Again, at Edward Kensington, it was a painful transition for some young boy actors. Um, some of those boy actors who did start acting again in the restoration, once women became very popular on stage um, and once women's roles took over were really left kind of jobless and sort of out in the cold. And so it was actually a pretty painful transition for those who studied for it for so long and honed those skills. And I think that's a flip side to the story that especially as a woman, I don't think about um, because to me, it's just sort of like, yay, women were able to act. <laughs> um, isn't that fantastic? But there was this sort of other side of it that is a little bit tragic for some of those um, boys. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the final bit that I have for you tonight, which is to talk about modern theater and gender. Um, this is a shot from our uh, Tempest, and I just love it, uh, I think, because Sonia's putting on her tie. <laughs> um, but we did a completely gender-reversed Tempest a couple of years ago, and um, the director of it was Christine Schmidla, who is the um, deputy um, text associate at Shakespeare's Globe. And her idea for this play was really that it shouldn't matter. Um, she didn't feel she had a statement to make. She tried to make the clothes, you know, she didn't make the women cut their hair. She didn't make them try to pretend they were men, but she also didn't change the text to change the gender pronouns. And there's only one female role in The Tempest, which is Miranda. And that role was played by a man. Um, and if, it, if, the if, the, if the show really did anything, what it did was highlight that there was just one woman. People never seem to notice if there's just one woman on stage, but they really noticed when there was just one man. And they're like, really? Is there only one you know, female role in this play to begin with once they saw it gender reversed? Um, and it really didn't matter. Um, she didn't make a statement on it in her director's notes. She 
that wasn't her intention. Her intention was to flip it and see what it looked like. Um, and uh, that is more and more common. We do have a do question. Have a question? Great. Um, so the question is, that how do you think the audience experienced the plays when boys played women? Did they buy in and suspend disbelief or were they always thinking, but that's a boy? <laughs> I think it depended on the audience member. Um, we definitely have those like strong Protestant people who were like, that's a boy kissing a boy. Um, and then we, I think we had a lot of people who were just there to enjoy the theater. Um, and we're able to totally suspend disbelief to watch those roles, except probably in those meta moments where Shakespeare really pointed out, like, like with Cleopatra, you know, like, this is a boy playing a woman talking about how she's so terrified to see herself played by a boy. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I don't fully know, but most of what I've read the reaction is more the opposite where when they finally see women play women, they're like, oh, that's not right. That can't be right. <laughs> that's not how women behave, is it? Um, so I think it was a little bit more of the opposite uh, as far as how, how audiences reacted then. I hope that answered the question. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about now is actually that we've tried to recreate that several times. Um, so I wanna talk about modern gender expression on the Shakespearean stage. So the first thing that we saw happen, oddly enough, um, was not what I just showed you, not Christine's idea of flipping the cast. What we first saw was, we first saw a push in the Shakespearean theater. And I would say this was in maybe even the late 90s to early aughts of this idea of trying all male casts again. So this idea that, well, that's the way Shakespeare did it. What would it look like if we did that, if we tried this? Um, there are some famous versions. There was a Romeo and Juliet that was set at an, uh, an all boys school. And so there were all boys playing the roles. Um, there's a very famous Taming of the Shrew that was done with all men. Um, and that's kind of how it started. And I, I don't know why that was the initial push, um, but I'm glad it happened because it did break us out of the thought that we needed to, that we needed to match the gender of the actor to the gender of the role or that the gender of the actor was at all important to the role. And it started opening things up for a lot of gender reverse casting. Um, and this also became more popular as the theater became a little less misogynistic. Um, so even in the time that I've been in theater, it went from, you know, here's the Shakespeare play we're doing. You're a girl, great. There are exactly three roles that are open to you in this play and the other 12 are going to be played by male actors. And then you show up in an audition room and there are 30 women and 15 men. And you're just thinking like, how am I ever gonna get a part? Um, and so that started to shift a little where directors and casting companies as women started to work their way up in the ranks of those theaters started to say, well, why couldn't a woman play Horatio? Like Horatio doesn't, give birth during the play. <laughs> like there's nothing that prevents anyone from playing Horatio. And that would only be if you changed it to play it as a woman, like say they were gender, they were expressing female gender in the character. The other thing is just to have a woman play the role and the pronouns and the expression of gender are the character that they're playing. Um, and that we don't need to worry about it. And that's actually where I get to suspension of disbelief. So I'm glad that someone brought that up. Um, <clears throat> Cause we seem to be fine suspending disbelief about certain things on the stage, right? Like we're like, okay, we know for sure that these two people aren't actually brother and sister but they're playing it on stage, so fine. Okay, we know for sure they didn't just murder that guy on stage but that's not what you do in theater. So we're fine, we'll accept it. Um, we know that the pl person playing, you know, Richard III is not actually in his real life, a maniacal monarch out to get his entire family. So we're willing to suspend our disbelief on a lot of things, 
Um, and so then the question became, why not suspend disbelief as far as which actor, which gender, whatever. And I want to make it clear that this was way before the conversation was on the table at theater companies about non-binary actors and about gender fluidity. So I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. And I know I'm talking in very binary terms and have been so far, but that's because that was the conversation that was being had. That isn't the conversation that should be had and that's not the conversation that's happening now. Um, but that's really what we're talking about, like how these pieces started to slide into place. It wasn't really about, you know, um, does you know like is gender a social construct it was more like well this person is a woman can they play a man um and I'm glad that the conversation has shifted to be about does it like it doesn't matter at all um and I think that that's really important so that's just kind of like the beginning of this modern transition and I would say it didn't start till the 1990s um and probably didn't become popular for women to play male roles until, I mean, it just like based on my own auditioning experience, maybe 2010 and onward. So we've really only seen this in the last like 11 years that it's been like, oh yeah, women can play a different role. And I say women playing male roles um, because I'm specifically talking about Shakespeare and what there's a lack of our, our female roles and what there's an abundance of our male roles. Um, so it's always looking for ways to get women on stage. And that really didn't become a conversation until, yeah, I think, or really become a possibility until 2010, 2011. When I was at the American Shakespeare Center, they were already doing it. Um, and that was really lucky for me to be educated there and to be educated sort of with that um, open-mindedness about it. One of the roles that I played there, I played this like crazy strong male soldier who comes in at the end of, not strong physically, like strong, like um, mentally and emotionally and really charged. And he comes in at the end of Henry VI and basically tells the Dauphin of France, um, like, you're going to get it. Like, we're coming for you and you're going to get it. Oddly enough, it's also the only non-historical role in that entire play. Everyone else is based on someone and this one character wasn't. And I remember feeling really nervous. Like, how is the audience going to believe that I am strong and in charge and coming in and saying this to the Dauphin and meaning it when I'm a woman? And every other role I've been given in Shakespeare has been, you know, that sort of like docile, um, ingenue type. And I remember the director at the time just being like, just come in, stand your ground and say it. It's up to the audience to fill in the blanks and like, let them do that. Um, and I thought that was really beautiful. And it really opened my eyes to what it could be like to be a woman playing a male role. It gives you even more scope as an artist to sort of find how to express that and stretch yourself. So I thought that was awesome. Um, then the sort of like newer facet of this is of course, non-binary actors and gender fluidity. I remember this first came up when we were talking about doing Sam Shepard's True West. Um, and I really, we really try at, at, at Flag Shakes to cast just the best actor for the role, regardless of anything else, regardless of um, skin color, regardless of gender, regardless of size, we really just try to say like, who's the best actor to play this role and then cast them in that part. Um, but when with Shakespeare, that's easy because there's no rights, um, you know, Shakespeare's very dead and he's not keeping tabs on who's casting what kind of person in which one of his roles. Um, but an, a playwright like Sam Shepard has a whole um, estate and has rights. And so I reached out because I said, I just want to make sure um, that if a woman you know, because um, uh, th there are no problems as far as like, you can cast it um, racially, however you would like to, you can cast it size wise, however you would like to, um, ability wise, however you would like to. But the caveat is that the, the, these two main characters have to be male. 
So I reached out to the Sam Shepard estate and I said, you know, well, do they have to, or could we cast the best actor for the role as long as they played the role as male? So they'll play the character exactly as it's written, no pronouns shifted, the relationship won't change, they'll still be brothers. Um, and the resounding answer, I think I asked more than twice from Sam Shepard's estate was no. Um, and then this really became an internal conversation in our company because then it's like, well, then who's assigning gender to the actor who's auditioning? Sam Shepard's estate? Like, are they gonna tell us whether or not the actor auditioning is male or female? Or is the actor auditioning gonna tell us whether or not they are male or female? And then where does that put us with the estate of Sam Shepard? And what kind of crazy policing are we gonna get into? Um, so that really was very startling to me that they were still holding that position. Um, and I just, I think that one of the absolute beauties of Shakespeare is that we don't have to run in circles with that. Um, actors can, you know, no matter how they gender identify, can audition for whatever role. Um, and one of the nice things that's come out of that is I think a theater companies have started to express their support, um, even if estates and playwrights haven't. And what we see now in auditions a lot of times is we see actors telling us how both how they gender identify and which roles they're comfortable playing and, and how they'd be comfortable playing those roles as far as how the role gender identifies. And it could sound like that gets more complicated, but I find that it actually makes everything much easier because then you really can just absolutely cast the best actor for the part without any concern about um, gender. So that's kind of where I'm gonna end things as far as my slideshow presentation. Um, I'm hoping that that like, stirred up some questions or comments in the audience. Um, and I would love to hear them. And while folks are, um, if we've got any questions popping up, um, so I'll go ahead and ask you, um, do you want to tell everyone um, what's, what's on the horizon for Flag Shakes, what you guys are planning and how people can um, be aware of uh, what they can hopefully attend in person in the future? Yeah, so um, we are going to do two shows. You guys will be one of the, some of the very first people to hear this big news. Um, we're gonna do a public announcement later, but we're doing two shows at the Flagstaff Amphitheater, the Pepsi Amphitheater out of Fort Tuthill um, this summer. And we're gonna do Hamlet and a Midsummer Night's Dream. And yes, there will be cross-gender casting. <laughs> um, also, um, the director is Jim Warren, who is the co-founder of the American Shakespeare Center that I was talking about earlier, where they really did hit on some of these ideas a lot sooner than the rest of us. Um, and he's coming out to direct those two shows and they're gonna go up the first two weekends of uh, July, so. Awesome, that's so yeah. exciting. Yeah. Oh, I think I see a question. Yeah, then actually you can go ahead and look. I, I'd read it, but you can see it now, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, so it's just, it's more of a thank you. So um, Todd just says, uh, given what you've done for our community, I have no doubt that you knocked it out of the park with a strong warrior in Henry VI. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and perspectives. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually ended up, that role has one of the best lines in all of Shakespeare, which is, um, would my eyeballs were to bullets turned that I in rage might shoot them in your faces. Ooh. Literally the best line I've ever said on stage. <laughs> so I hope you like that. So we have a question here. Um, How has the Flagstaff community been responding to that approach to casting? and other changes nationally to how the theater world responded in 2020. Um, I think the Flagstaff community has been responding in a really great way. I only had one or two comments after, after Tempest that said something along the lines of like, that was weird and I don't understand why you did that. Most people just came up and said like, 
I kind of forgot that you like that you had gender bent it. Like it didn't matter to me the entire play. And that was really lovely. Um, yeah, the theater world in 2020 was really upended. And this is not just about gender, obviously. This is about um, racial equality in the theater, equality in casting, et cetera. Um, and I think that I think that the response was good. And then I think now we are all responsible to hold our own feet to the fire on actually living up to the promises that we made to the BIPOC community. Um, it's something that Flag Shakes takes very seriously. And, you know, we actually just had interviews for um, a new position that we're hiring, which is um, diversity and casting, or sorry, equality and casting director. We want those two things to be together in our company. And so we just had interviews for that. And uh, one of the people interviewing was saying, I'm so glad to see, you know, like theater companies actually doing this and following through. And my response to her was that, I don't think we knew what we didn't know. I think we thought we were, you know, like doing it all and so woke and so, and 2020 was just a huge eye-opening experience for the theater as far as like what is going on and where we are failing people. And there are other issues where we're failing people. We're failing people based on body type. We're failing people based on, you know, um, ability or disability. We're failing people on obviously on skin color. We're failing people on accents. We're failing, we're failing people in so many ways, but what that really is, is an opportunity to change and rethink things. And so I think that, you know, the Flagstaff community definitely responds, responds well to inclusion, equality, especially the artistic community here. I just haven't found any resistance like to people going like, no, this is the way we've always done it and we can't change. Like we have a really, we already have a really diverse and interesting artistic community. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered that question too. I feel like I sometimes go on a tangent, but. No, I, think you, I think you kind of nailed it. Well, and I'm sure our community probably greatly appreciates how, um, how forward thinking you're being, because it is very easy to fall into those entrenched patterns, those, you know, those expectations that, you know, it's what we've always done and, and to really question yourself and, oh my goodness, I swear, it is a rule that my dogs will start <laughs> playing the minute I'm, they have been silent throughout your entire presentation. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't see any part of the conversation. <laughs> Honestly, the one's a German shepherd. He's, he's having a ball, just knocking his <laughs> around. It's great. Um, and I don't see any other questions. So I'm going to go ahead and just, uh, you know, first of all, Don, thank you so much for your time. Um, so everybody knows the reason why we can have these sessions for free is because our presenters give their time freely and um, to have Don join us and share her expertise was so meaningful. This was fabulous. I will make sure that we have information about how you can stay aware of what's going on with Flag Shakes in the near future so you can make sure you support them. And uh, yeah, we'll be sending out the, the um, recording from this uh, hopefully sometime this week. And I hope you all have a fabulous night and yeah, happy spring. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I see some friendly names in the box and thank you all for attending um and i also see some people i don't know so i hope to meet you this summer <laughs> awesome all right Bye. good night everyone <laughs>